Hi, everyone. Welcome to Kickoff Labs on Growth. I'm Josh Ledgard, and today's episode is going to be about product design. With me today is our designer at Kickoff Labs, Laura Lee Flores. She does an amazing job designing not only the landing pages and widget templates you use at Kickoff Labs, but also evolving the Kickoff Labs application and the user experience of using our product, which means the dashboard where you manage your campaigns, you go back and you search for your leads, where you manage your landing pages, uh, the settings, all of that stuff. I love the perspective she brings to these conversations when she and I are working on a design challenge, and I wanted to tease out some of the things I've learned from working with her over the last few years. Thanks for agreeing with me at the last minute this morning to be a guest on the podcast. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, so before we get into it, what's your background and how did you get into product design and user experience? My, um, so I came from a uh, psychology background. My, my undergraduate degree was in psychology, and uh, I did a graduate degree in applied psychology. Um, and as I jumped into that program, I became really interested in um, human-computer interaction, which is basically what they used to call usability. Um, and I got, I really liked that, and that's where I focused, uh, you know, but but the the program itself was one where we just looked at like the psychology of how people think and process information and apply that to the design of products. At the time, usability wasn't, I mean, there was no graduate degrees in usability or programs or anything like usability wasn't even really, there was only a few places where there were even jobs in usability at the time. And uh, a lot of my um, coworkers or, or people also in the program thought, that I was kind of crazy for being interested in that and the psychology of like websites and web applications uh, because a lot of them were doing like it, it was really big in the aeronautical industry and the, and the automotive industry with the, the displays in your cars and stuff. But basically, we just looked at the psychology and understanding really basic cognition on how it makes sense for us to go for a person to experience something and and, and be able to learn and understand something, especially in high stress moments. And that's so that's where my like educational background um, it started with with this. And um, I after like graduate school, I um, went onto a usability team um, and a few years later was leading the usability team. And I got really interested in um, kind of like creating because as part of it we had to uh we would do run be running usability tests and we'd need to have different versions of a of a design together to see um we'd we'd experience something and say oh we need to change this and as part of changing it sometimes we test a couple different designs uh and i just you know and i started becoming really interested in the actual design of things i saw how integral and important that was and so i kind of just started like as part of that work, I would design some of the interfaces. Um, it would just make it faster instead of sending it over to the design team. Um, and I would just design it just as a um, kind of a low fidelity kind of design, just as something just to test the, the concept out. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of continued to follow that through and, and really enjoyed the design part and continue to do that. And eventually after um, a number of years and um, I, during that time, I also learned to code. And so I, um, kind of combine those and and that's kind of how I got into web and product design. Well, and that's a that's really uh, for, at a small company. I mean, somebody with your kind of experience, that's what what makes you perfect for working at a company like ours, which is really a tiny company. It's because you've got to go and and wear so many hats from the actual design to the interaction to like, you know, user feedback and, you know, hearing that all directly. And so you know, it's probably a good thing for people to think about, especially if they want to work or are working at a smaller company, like how can they expand into a different hat or how can they expand into a different part of design so they're not just doing one thing, that they're bringing an improvement to all the parts of the product. Um, so what does a good product experience mean to you? I think that, you know, when you think about the experience of, of someone interacting with a product, it really it really has to be based on like the user and their their success. So if someone comes into uh, using a product, they you know their interaction with it needs to be not only like successful, like they're able to do the things that they want to do, but it should be like a really pleasant experience. And I think that that is what makes it 
uh, a good experience. So they're able to go through, it's easy, it's enjoyable, it's intuitive, they're able to see the opportunities. And I think the really great experiences are when someone's going through and using your product and they they get this moment of like, oh, I can do that. I didn't think I'd be able to do that. And that excitement, um, there's a level of excitement and saying, oh, that's great that they're solving that problem for me. Um, and so I think it's a good experience is one that's really thoughtful uh, as part of like the product creator where someone's really thinking about the problems the users experience and the flow that they go through and making that that smooth for them and positive. It, it's almost like um, thinking about uh, a like moments of joy for a user. I mean, so, I mean, yeah. when I see the way you approach design, I often think that like you're looking for what's the user's moment of joy through this experience. Like at what point do they hit that, not just the aha moment, but that like recapping and showing them like, hey, this is, you know, this is what you've done. Um, and I think about, uh, I think about that when, uh, for example, we were working at kickoff labs in the onboarding. Um, and this is a, an earlier revision of our onboarding for a long time had the final step where we sort of summarized everything that the person had done, um, in one view to kind of give them an overview of like, you know, Hey, it only took you five minutes, but look at everything you've set up. You've got these two landing pages, you've got this contest and you can go click on it and it's live now. Um, and I think, yes. you know, it's, it's moments like that, that, that I, I like to look for too, when we're designing a feature or product of like, oh, like, you know, it's that summarizing for the user, all that they've accomplished. And, you know, we eventually yes. replaced that with the, the, uh, with the, the dashboard, because I like that concept so, so much of like showing them like this, you know, an overview of this large thing that they just created, creating a, a landing page campaign. And so now the dashboard kind of looks a little bit like that, where we show them literally like, here's the sign up page you created, here's the thank you page you created, and here's the the email, <laughs> the yes. emails that you can set up next. Exactly. Like I think that that like what you said is like the, the you you show them as they're going through and and doing what that you know what they want to do, but like showing these tangible um, rewards that they're getting from doing that. That like it brings it brings joy, it brings excitement, it helps them. I get closer to their goal. Uh, and I think that that like, yes, I, I love that on the onboarding when, when they got to that point and, and now with the dashboard, how they're able to see, oh, look what I've done, look what I created and look how easy it is for me to continue to um, get a little bit closer, you know, and iterate on what I've, where I've gotten, like, especially like w we made a change recently um, to make it even easier for people to create more landing pages. So after they've created, they've gone through onboarding, they've created their initial landing page. It's really easy now to click a button and, and immediately get another landing page. And, and I, that experience of saying immediately getting that reward of, mm -hmm. oh, this is really easy. It's something that, um, you know, took a, took a bit of work in the background to make it smooth. Um, but to see it, you know, make it so easy for them to, to get where they wanted to go. Yeah, absolutely. So when we set out um, uh, kind of looking at a new feature and or an ex improving an existing one, and I want to get a little bit more specific here. So the thing that we just shipped uh, literally yesterday uh, was an integration with Unsplash. And for anybody who doesn't know, Unsplash is a service where um, people have you know, kind of royalty free stock photos. Um, and it's used in products and where we wanted to use it in the product was to improve people's ability to select images in the product if they didn't already have an image they wanted to use. So if this primarily gets used in cases where people are looking for a background image on a landing page that fits with their brand or, um, you know, other aspects of stock photography, like showing people using technology or something like that, um, and so we had an image picker already in the product, um, and obviously lots of products have image pickers. And so when I said that we were going to work on that, like, where did you go uh, to look at in terms of like, because we we're going to have a chance at updating the whole picking experience. So, like, how, how did you start that process, or what did where do you think about starting a process like that when we're taking a, a feature apart and kind of re-implementing it or reimagining it? Yeah, I guess uh, the first. The first place I start is I always I always try to put myself as much as possible in the mind of our users. 
So like I try to imagine someone who's just signed up, they went through onboarding, they created the landing page and I just try to get myself mentally where they're at. They're trying to like get this page to look really good, to make it look professional. Um, and I picture like them going through that and, and I, and what challenges are they facing? So, I mean, with the, with the image picker in particular, there wasn't a ton sometimes in other product designs that we're doing, that is really crucial for the image picker. It wasn't as much because it's pretty, a pretty simple process. They're on the page. They just need to update the image. Um, and so what I, what I'll do is after that point for the image picker one, that was just a really quick, just a, just a minute of me thinking, okay, where are they at? What are they doing? But that's where I, where I always start is trying to figure out what, where's the the user's mental state. They're probably in a state of excitement at this point of saying, oh, I'm getting this, this exactly where it is, where I want it, or hopefully not in a state of like, oh, let's, you know, I don't know, maybe like, I'm not quite sure what I want, or, you know, like they might just trying to figure out where they're at mentally. So that's kind of where I start. And I looked at, um, and then I also think, you know, there's a lot of really great products out there that, um, have also gone through this and thought through this and uh, spent a lot of time thinking through and working through a solution for this. So um, if I can learn from something they've done, that's that's the, my very next step is first I try to understand where our users are at. And then I go to say, what, what examples can I see and what can I find about what works? And so I try to find any applications first. I look for applications that are already doing that. And so for the Unsplash work, I looked at um, some other landing page creators um, and so I looked at like um, Unbounce and I looked at Instapage and and um, and then I looked. And so when I'm looking at like an, an application, I'm I want to see kind of what what not only the inner like not only what like the interface looks like, but I kind of want to look at the interaction. I want to see the whole sequence of events that lead up to how they accomplish this. They solve this for their users. Um, and I just try to learn from them whatever I can. So that's my first step is, uh, or my second step after thinking about our users is to jump in and and try to experience this. Um, and then- that, and That's one of the things I think you, that you do really well that I really enjoy working with you is that you, um, when we tackle something like this, you go and you do your research about the the people who have solved this before, maybe at even bigger companies and said like, you know, thought that, well, they must have thought through this. So what are the- and you always do a great job of laying out on a canvas, like, you know, five, you know, different, you know, visions or views of this from other products saying like, hey, here's how these other products solve similar problems. And it allows me as somebody who's like working with you, like on the design to say, okay, well, like you said, from our user's perspective, which elements of each of these things works really well for us in our case. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot I did that. I do. I, I, bring I'll take a lot of pictures as I'm going through I'll take pictures of what um, things that I that I liked um, and ways that they solved it sometimes I'll even include pictures of um, things that I don't think worked well um, because sometimes even um, there's something within what they've done that um, sometimes will spark spark an idea and so I do I bring those all into I use sketch and so I just create, um, usually I have a page where we're, we're working on a design for it, but um, if not, I'll just create a new empty document and I put these, I'll take pictures and I, and I grab pictures as I'm going around. I also will bring pictures from, I look oftentimes to like, um, any, I have a couple, two places I look usually just for designs and these are just like really just just designs they're not in applications they're not live live code it's just designs that other designers have put together for something like this um and so for like the for the um image picker i look to see if there was an image picker or in and i look in dribble for those designers out there you know what dribble is i look in dribble first and then I actually have a Pinterest board where I have gathered together a lot of product. It's just called my product design board where I kind of like scroll through those product designs um, and anything that I find that's pertinent, I take a picture and I bring that in. Um, and I think it's really helpful because Josh is really good. You're really good at like um, at design ideas and coming up with solutions too. So there's lots of times where you come up with a solution I hadn't thought of and we're able to work together based on these images I pull together. And so I, uh, I do it not only for myself to see them all at once together in this board, um, but also just so that you can tease out ideas that maybe didn't stand out to me when I looked at it originally. And it strikes me the next step 
um, that you go through just thinking about, you know, our process, which is, is not a very formal process being a, such a small company, but yeah. the next step that you always go through, which is, is useful is once we walk through kind of these other designs of saying, okay, we're here, we like this from this product. We like this from this product. And we start applying it to ours is you generally come up with, you know, a few different approaches of the UI within, uh, within our product. And it's almost the same view, except now we're looking at it as a sketch of, here's what these different models look like for our users within our product. And then we kind of, and, and then we take that step. That's like the next step is like, yeah, just kind of applying those best practices. Okay. Well, how does this approach look in our product? How would this approach look? And you sort of map the best of, of these designs into, into your product. Exactly. I've, um, and, you know, I've done this. So I do the same like general process for almost everything that I design, whether that's inside products or, or for websites so, or like right now I'm working on the land, you know, some landing pages that I'm designing. And that's what I do is I, I will take these, I'll take pictures of different things. I pull them together and it's amazing um, what the, like the insight and the ideas that come together. When you think about your solution I mean, the, the, everything else, like everything's been designed and it's not specifically for your user. So you don't want to mm -hmm. just take a design that someone else did and put it in yours. You you really have to think about your users and your flow and your product and how your customers are coming um, uniquely to solve the problem that you're trying to solve um, for them. And so you, you're you able to pull those together. And then, yeah, we just create sometimes, sometimes it's really clear to us. I feel like sometimes we really know, okay, that's a really good idea with this one. And that's a good idea with this other one. And we pull them together and it just really works. Sometimes we have to go through a number of iterations of it, but I feel like we do a pretty good job at um, designing pretty quick and, and making progress pretty fast and not, not spending a lot of time on just the design itself. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. It's like thinking about how, uh, how we think about it from the user's perspective of your product. So in the Unsplash example, one of the things that stood out to me is I thought like, oh, we'll just have this search that goes to Unsplash. And I wasn't thinking about many other ways of like filtering the search. But when you started putting it from our user's perspective, you might search for an image um, that you want as a background. And the backgrounds on landing pages are typically wider than they are tall. Um, because they'll they'll span the whole width of a section or a page. Um, and the problem with just a general image search is that you get back portrait images as well as as well as landscape images, the the wider ones. And the portrait images will often get cut off at the top and the bottom in the in the in the wide case. And so I wouldn't have if I was just copying like insert an image, you know, into like a blog post or something that other tools have, like in WordPress, like their insert an image thing, I wouldn't think at all about the landscape or the horizontal. But when it when you start putting it in the context of our users, you realize how important that is because oftentimes people will end up choosing these portrait images if we just put them in there without any sort of label. And they'll say, well, why is the top of the head cut off? Or why are the eyes cut <laughs> off? And we get those support requests back. And I, I'm always trying to think of, okay, well, what what a, what user objections or what support requests are going to come if we don't offer this? <laughs> um, and so we ended up having to implement that that filter before we shipped it because I think, you know, we were trying to think through, okay, what what is an objection or a problem that users are going to run into based on our experience with working with these users. And, you know, I know that we get a lot of support tickets about why is this image cut off? And yep. uh, I, feel, I feel like I've spent way too much time explaining geometry to people. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, and screen ratio sizes. Yeah, and screen ratio sizes. If I could not yeah. uh, not explain geometry or screen ratio sizes anymore, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be good. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point you bring up because you're right. That was, that was something that we didn't see in any other image picker really, um, but it really pertained to ours. Um, and so, and what's interesting about that is that filter that Josh just mentioned that we added in, um, didn't come from any of those that we saw. It was really based on that. And, um, I had gone back after we said, oh, you know, Josh brought that up one time when we were, when we were talking through the design of the, of the unsplash work. And, um, and he said, oh, you know, and he, and he brought that up and I said, oh, you're right. And so I went back and looked through different ways that people filter, um, and so I, I go back and, and so I oftentimes like, it's not just, um, it's kind of like, I will go through the process. That's like, you know, I'll look at designs that other people design and then we'll go into the solution. And sometimes I go back to look at designs and say, oh yeah, how did people solve this? 
Um, and, and oftentimes like it's really helpful. I don't, um, sometimes it only takes me maybe five minutes of just looking around for just a minute to say, am I headed in the right way? Um, right direction and just looking at a few ideas and, and to make sure it's because what you want to do is you want to make sure that what you create is something that's really clear. Um, and, and so sometimes I just need to like, it's almost like a sanity check for me. Am I thinking about this the right way? And so I take a look around to see how other people filter and sort. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is, seems to be really effective because you also, not only do you want to, you want to be, your users are, are using other products, not just yours. And so you also have to keep in mind that like what they're used to in different places is what they're going to expect from your product. And so not only do you want to be really clear and have it look really nice, but, and also be a really good experience for your users, but you need to make sure to, to keep in mind that they're, they're using other products and they have certain expectations coming into your, using your product based on their experience with other products. So you want to kind of make sure that they're, you're not doing anything too radical and too different. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Like there's places where there's opportunities within your products and maybe around your product's unique values um, where you have to go kind of off the rails and independent and do something that that is going to be unique that might require some user education. But like a feature like this, the, the, image, um, the image picker, I think when it's a great example because it's like, well, that is a solved problem that users like people who work in marketing or people who have used marketing tools before, they've probably experienced, you know, 20, 30 other image pickers. And if we did something radically different, it would probably just cause user frustration. Yes, exactly. Um, whereas when we're, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, on our side, like the the viral mechanics that you can do within Kickoff Labs, I think that's our opportunity to add something unique to a design conversation around landing pages. Is is how we um, how we represent where people are within a contest, or how many referrals they've tracked, and how we, you know, implement that. That's a chance for us to be unique and do something that doesn't exist in many other places because it just doesn't. Yeah. Um, but but there's some areas you have to identify the areas of the product that you know this is where we think we need to stand out or we should stand out and these are the areas where it just has to flow with user expectations within the context of you know what they expect yeah and you know and going along with that is that you definitely like you want to be unique and you and you do want to like you can put your own twist on on your own designs and and certain parts of your interface as you're working on your product. Um, and, and, but you always you just want to really just keep in mind where they're coming from. Is this is that can is this going to be fun and different for your users? If so, like go for. It. Is this going to be like a source of frustration for them? Um, then that's something that you just want, you just want to keep in mind. Yeah, and so we've 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 kind of covered like through this like through the process we've we've uncovered sort of this this initial research you know does it exist before what are the what are the, what are the you know what are the best parts of each of these solutions your users context and then fitting the best of the research you've done into your users context um, and then we get into the and that kind of leads us to the implementation when you start working through it and. Of course, all of our designs and implementations end up looking exactly like they did in Sketch in the end, right? <laughs> you know, um, it kind of depends. A lot of times you will start jumping into a, a design, implementing it, and um, we'll make some some slight changes, especially like Sketch with the font sizes. You, it's, oh, that looked good on this size, but, you know, we really actually need five columns. Like for the image picker, we ended up going with five columns instead of like what we kind of originally imagined as four columns. So we kind of adjust as as we go along. Um, but but you know it gives us a good enough start. And, you know, and sometimes, and this isn't usually the case for product design specifically, but there are certain cases um, for small parts of the interface that um, sometimes we're pretty clear on. We don't even need to design, and we can jump right into you know creating it. Um, but but I definitely would say that we don't spend too much time on, on like we'd mentioned before, focused on, on the actual design part, because as you know, we realize as you jump into creating it, you're mm -hmm. going to learn a lot more and see actually if, if that design works once you, once you're able to um, kind of go through the experience of using it. So once we've got a design to a point where, you know, we've walked through it and we feel like it works, 
how do you know, um, you know, what are, what are the clues you get to know if a design is successful or not? I, let's see, that's a good question. So when, when we get, I mean, at this point, we've thought a lot through um, what, what um, other people are doing, what designs we've looked at. I and mean, we've gotten, we've gone out, we've, we've looked around and we feel confident in our like kind of direction, I'm sure at that point. Um, but like, and I think onboarding is a, we, was a good example of this, of whether a design is successful. Sometimes I don't really think that we know. And we've done at this point our best guess kind of at like what we think is going to be good. Um, and, you know, we go through it, but like, I don't think that we can really say that it's, it's going to, that what we've done and we've created is really successful until we put it out there for our users to use and experience and see if that makes them get more wins. If it's like, if it makes them more successful, then we know that, that what we did was, was really good. And if the experience of, of what they've done is a positive one for them. Um, so like I mentioned that, um, uh, onboarding was something that that was a really fun project that we've gone back and iterated and changed and modified and customized based on user feedback. I feel like the first phase that we did of the on of like onboarding, which was basically would walk for those of you who aren't familiar, it would walk once you want to create a new campaign, like you're starting something new or you just sign up for kickoff labs. There's um, it walks you through the, the process of, of creating that campaign. And there's just a few steps, but we just wanted to make it really easy for customers to go through and, and be able to accomplish those steps really fast and easily. Um, and we have, we've modified that as we've gotten feedback and as we've seen where, where customers still had struggles. So um, I think that like, when you consider this, whether a, a design is successful is, is keeping your, your mind open to saying, trying not to like invest yourself in saying this is the design I created it's beautiful and perfect and nobody can change it but saying you know is this helping the user um is this accomplishing the goal that that they're trying to accomplish within our product um and how can we make it better we've start we've got this first phase out there what can we do to make this even better for them or even smoother um and just be constantly looking for for ways to improve I think you know that's I think that's like kind of the best way I could say whether something's successful or not is just say, is it helping them? Good. What else can we do to make it even better for them? Yeah. And I think an important part of that that I wanted to talk about was the was the was the data because when I look at some of the bigger things we work on, like the onboarding, <clears throat> like the onboarding, and even the smaller things like the unsplash thing, like I've always got a metric or two in mind that we're measuring um, wow. to see if I feel like it's making an improvement. And so with onboarding, we knew from the product that people um, were much more likely to upgrade if they'd gone and published uh, and published landing pages and had like a sign up on the page. And so I looked at it from the perspective of how can we get people to that success, uh, you know, that, that first like aha success, like, oh, I've got this campaign with a landing page faster. Um, and so now, you know, we, I looked at it and said, okay, can we get that percentage of people with, that have a published campaign uh, much higher? And now we go with the onboarding steps, walking people through. I mean, we went from probably, you know, 40 to 60% of people having a published page of any kind that sign up for a free account to probably more like 85 to 90% um, after we implemented the onboarding. And so to me, that's a great way to know if a design is successful. Um, I'm kind of like numbers driven that way. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then I was just looking at like uh, some of the numbers in the designer and I'll, I'll peruse some of our, our metrics and see how things are, are trending. And I realized, you know, it was a couple months ago, we implemented um, the ability to have co to copy a section. And I always want to know, you know, re retrospectively, like, was that worth the, the feature? Um, and just as some context, copying a section means if you have a section on your landing page and you just want to reuse that section again. Um, we had a couple of users asking for it in support. And I thought like, oh, I can see the use case for that. And I can see how it um, would aligns with our goals of getting people um, to success and getting people published landing pages faster. So I went ahead and implemented it. And um, but going back, did I know it was successful? I'd probably have to say, yes, I know now it's successful because when I compare, um, when people are adding sections, because you can also add brand new sections to a landing page to copying sections, 
Um, the copy section is copying existing section is as popular as adding the top four new design sections. Oh wow! And so the number of people using copy section uh, is, I mean, it it's basically means that like it's providing as much value as as the top four sections that people go when they say add section in the in the designer. And so to me. That means it's a fairly popular feature, um, you know, up there with, you know, like adding and, and when it comes to building the landing page. And so it, it meant that, like, it wasn't just the two or three people who emailed support. It was, you know, the two or three people that emailed support and the couple hundred other people that just never bothered to email us <laughs> and know. say this would be really useful because all those people are now using that that feature. And it's a small thing, but it's good to go back even on the smaller features you implement and say, like, did this really improve the user's experience. And even if you didn't have the question in mind at first, it's always good to go back at the end and look at a feature like that and and know whether or not it was worth the investment. Yes, uh, absolutely. And also ask yourself, because every additional feature you add um, has the potential of making the product less, not as easy to use or as intuitive. So like, I think it's a great thing to look at to say, okay, does it is this feature being used? Is it helpful for people? If not, we should consider removing it because that's part of what makes a product really great is finding those things that the customers want and that they're using and that helps them and removing those things that are just distractions that they don't actually want. Yeah. But I love that. I remember that. I remember that discussion that we had about whether to add that copy section. Yeah, and it, and you know, I don't think we used a, a ton of data at the time to make that decision, and like whether it was a good idea. Um, and so I didn't really know until this morning when I was thinking about this podcast, like if it had succeeded or not. But I went back and started looking at some of the features that we did. Um, and I, I want to say I'm glad you brought up the point about removing things as an important part of product design, especially if you've got a product that is been out there for a year or two at least then chances are you've got some things in the product that aren't benefiting users or that you've added for the sake of you know maybe one or two customers that aren't it's not something that's generally applicable um and that's a really important thing to look at in design too and i know that you know probably the biggest time we've gone through recently in that was when we updated the dashboard when it mm. showed people you know, the, um, when it showed people like the, um, their landing, like the overview of the campaign where it has the landing pages and the emails and, and the features of the campaign. And for that, we really took a, a data, I really took a, we really took a data driven approach. I mean, I looked at every single, like, I think I looked at every single pixel on that page so many times I said, is this <laughs> pixel helping somebody? Yes or no. And I, I took it and just like <laughs> did the KonMari method on their design. Yes. And I think I sent you like some designs and said, you know, I changed our dashboard today and I think I removed everything. <laughs> <laughs> can you help, can you, can you help me with this process? Um, and it was really useful because it, it forced me to look at like the, the, the stats in our product and say like, you know, how many people are using, you know, this button or how many people are using this link to go, you know, this quick link we have to edit the landing page, or do we need all of the specific landing page options exposed on the campaign homepage, or can we hide some of those a little bit deeper or can we even get rid of some of them? Um, yes. And so I think, I think about that effort that we did as redesigning our dashboard as addition by subtraction. Cause I think we actually removed more things than we added yes. um, in that case. But I know it was successful because one of the immediate impacts is we saw probably a 30 to 40% boost in our upgrade rate after we did that. And we got feedback back from customers saying that, Oh, this is a really, you know, this is a great simple layout or I like, you know, the direction you guys have taken and, you know, the language that customers use sometimes to say like, Oh, this feels really simple. Um, and that's exactly what we were going for when we redesigned the dashboard is kind of getting out of our user's way and focusing on just the things that are most important. And if, you know, for, for people that are looking for that buried feature, it's still there. And I think it's okay that, you know, they might have to go and look at a support doc to find it or email support because I'd rather have the one or two people email us than 80% of the people confused about, you know, how do they do the common thing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm so glad you brought up the dashboard uh, improvement that we made because I, I, I think that like what was so great about that was that's a perfect example of like the dashboard that we had before was an improvement on the dashboard that we had before that. Um, and 
And but this new dashboard that we had was one where not only did we remove stuff, um, we added things and we and but like we also um, at this point, we'd been running um, for our business customers and enterprise customers. We do a free landing and campaign review. So we go through and we look at your campaign and we tell you we give you some ideas on best case practices and stuff and and uh, look through your landing page and give you some ideas on how to um get your campaign to perform better. And um, and we had gone through that, that so many times that at that point, we when we were doing the dashboard, um, we're able to use that. And now, like as we do those landing page reviews, before we had to jump into different pages. And now when we do those landing page reviews, um, we can I can go through the whole campaign right from that first page. I can say, here's your landing pages, and I can identify um, any improvements that you might have with like your domain or anything there, um, which w- with what you've got published, we see exactly like details about like the emails that are sending out, how you're rewarding leads. Um, and so you go through and, and we can see like all the really important parts of the campaign um, in a really simple way. Like you said, we did remove a lot, but there's like the, the vital parts of what's there is, is right there on that dashboard. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, I love that point that you made about, you know, if you've got a product that's been out there for a year or two or longer that that hasn't changed, take a, try to like take a step back and ask yourself, what can we remove? If you had to walk someone through your, your product, is there anything, do you have to go through multiple pages to explain it? Can you make it simpler? And, and I love that, that I'm glad you brought that up. I'd forgotten about that work and the, that improvement that we made there. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, we didn't just remove, I mean, like you said, we did add a, a bunch to that page, but it, it was things that we were getting questions about all the time. So yep. we would get questions and support all the time about where do I set the social, the share images for my contest or where do I set the, you know, where do I make sure what I'm sharing on Facebook is what I want it to be. And so we thought, you know what, I mean, this comes up with so many people and it, uh, to me, a good rule of thumb, if you've got a product out there, you know, with, uh, with any traction is if, if, if three or four people take the time to email you, there's probably three or 400 other people that just like ignore it or don't yes. bother to email you because they'll try and work around the problem. And so, you know, we took the, the social sharing settings and we just exposed it right on the dashboard. So that was adding something to the dashboard but it helped people get, I don't think we get nearly the amount of questions on the social sharing that we used to get since then. And it's not, I don't have a real quantitative number. It just feels like the questions have gone down because it's front and center. And like you said, we had a checklist of things. We were always clicking and looking to make sure people had set and we wanted them to set um, as part of using the product. And now like that checklist, we basically took that, that we were doing and put that in front of the users. Like there's literally on the dashboard, it says, one, one sign up pages two, two thank you pages yep. three, three like the co- how people are points and four yeah. the emails and like we're walking people through that checklist like right on that the front of that page and i think that that's really you know if people are thinking about onboarding and the home pages of their products and their, and their dashboards i think that's important to think about it's like when you look at your customers um and you look at what they're doing in the product what are the you know the you know three to ten things you look for and then ask yourself, are those three to 10 things exposed for the customer in an easy way? Um, and yes. it can have, have a big payoff, or at least it did for us. It was a good improvement and a good uptick in terms of people, uh, people converting uh, on our side. Um, so where, um, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, designs uh, that work well, um, at kickoff labs, where would you, uh, where would you improve like on our process or what we're doing or, you know, specific features, like where would you want to improve? Um, I think that the area for improvement, you know, and as we're talking through this, um, I feel like we're doing some things really well. Um, and we're constantly improving and we're, we're, we take feedback and I think those things we do really, really well. Like we listen to our customers, um, and I think that, you know, our customer support is has been a really, really helpful area for us to identify problems. And I think that um, maybe one area that we could improve on is being maybe more proactive in saying, OK, customers reach out to us about our problems, but um, maybe we should be reaching out to customers and walking through and maybe, um, you know, running more 
usability tests or reaching out and seeing if they're running into any problems. Um, that's something that we could do a little bit better and see, you know, and actually talk, like get on the phone and talk to users. We did that for a little bit. Um, we've gotten away from that in the, in the last little bit, but I think getting back into doing that a little more, I think would be one area we can improve. And then I think, um, I, I like what you were saying about the numbers, especially with that copy section, um, because I I remember we talked about it. We'd seen it come up a couple of times in support. And I personally had had the same kind of pain point as, you know, creating some landing pages and stuff myself. And so I had wanted that feature myself. Um, but like, um, yeah, to being able to maybe see quantitatively and pay attention to those features that we do add and say, are they working as this early improvement? Um, and, and keeping track of those numbers, I think maybe could be another area for me, at least that I could do to improve a little bit more to say, oh, you know, we added this feature, does it work? Or we're going to um, change this part in the product, let's do a test to make sure that like, the customers are more successful after the change of the design, um, and actually test that, um, you know, using data to make sure that even that it is an improvement and and so that you know for sure, using more data-driven um, results, I think, is one area that I could also improve in. That I think that, like, if we did that a little bit more, that we could say with more confidence uh, that these that these changes that we're making and these designs and these changes are are all good. Yeah, I agree. I think the biggest thing, um, the biggest thing for us is is being more, like you said, I think more proactive about um, reach identifying customer problems. So reaching out to them and say, finding out where they're getting stuck more yeah. um, personally or watching them use the product more. I've learned a lot, the couple yeah. of support cases where I've shared a screen with a customer recently and and kind of had them like doing it. It's always frustrating. Like, don't click there. Don't, <laughs> oh, I meant there. And like yes. you're, you're, you're walking them through and you kind of see like the problems people have. And we could definitely do more of, of that to, yeah. to walk people through um, and see where they're, where they're getting stuck. And then, you know, validating that that's the right area of investment with some of the, uh, with some of the data we've got um, we've got on the product because, you know, now that we've got, we've got a, a good amount of traction, we can see like, you know, where, where are trends, what are people using or what should they, we, what do we think they should be using? Yes, totally agree. Cool. I think that's, um, so that takes us way past <laughs> the time that I was expecting to, uh, to have, but I, I really enjoyed the conversation today, um, going through the design and I hope that, uh, well, I know that people uh, will learn something about you know, product design, just kind of thinking, going through how we were designing the product and the thought process that we've had and the process that we've had at Kickoff Labs. Um, if you find that helpful, uh, feel free to email uh, us. So I'm josh at kickofflabs.com uh, and Lorley, you're Lorley at kickofflabs.com. Yeah. Um, if uh, anybody has any feedback on this episode or comments or questions about the design at Kickoff Labs, or you've got some feedback about the design at Kickoff Labs, um, I look forward to chatting again with you. And we're going to talk about, uh, probably in one of our next talks, we'll talk about designing for conversions. <laughs> I look forward to that. That'll be fun. Cool. Thanks again for uh, for joining me today. Thank you.